So the underlying strategy behind uh, all of the work that we're doing with BFO is a hub and spokes strategy for bringing about interoperability between domain ontology development in multiple different areas. And uh, this hub and spokes idea is not original with BFO, so the, um, there are a number of uh, independently developed hub and spokes uh, activities within the ontology world. There are also ontology suites which don't use hubs, but for instance the suite called Sweet, um, the Semantic Web for Earth and Environmental Terminology, the NASA ontology suite. Uh, but most suites um, use hubs, top-level ontology hubs. And most of the suites which use hubs use BFO as the hub. So the orange ones down the left-hand side are examples of suites which are now being developed, uh, some of which are quite mature, um, using BFO as the hub. Now, how do you choose which top-level ontology to use as the hub in a suite of ontologies which are designed to be interoperable and to uh, foster interoperability among the data which is annotated using those ontologies? Well, the first criterion is that it should be a true top-level, so there should be no overlap with domain ontologies. It should be small, it should be well documented, and this is an example of the best we could do in the way of documenting an ontology. This is a how-to guide to building ontologies using BFO, which is targeted to those people who are developing ontologies for specific purposes in specific domains and would like to use a hub and spoke strategy because then they don't have to think about all the questions which this meeting has been addressing. They can just build their domain ontologies by downward population from the hub. Now, if they're going to be able to use BFO as top level, they have to be able to understand the definitions. They also have to be able to rely on the fact that the hub is well formalized so that they can use it in conjunction with Protégé or some other ontology editor. It should be easily extendable it should be easy to downward populate from a hub in such a way that your domain ontology can conform to it. It should be quality controlled. That, that is to say there should be critical people who have found errors in the hub and who have helped to make the hub more consistent. And we have had very aggressive quality control on BFO from the very beginning. We have a user group which has 130 members and uh, many of them are very vocal. It should change only rarely and conservatively. Now I was sad to see that Dolce has changed yet again in quite radical ways, at least on the surface, uh, where BFO has, has bent over backwards not to change except under very, very special circumstances and then with minimal changes. That's because we have thousands of people using BFO and if we make a change they will become very annoyed and they, if we'd made many changes they would have left long ago. And finally the principal criterion for choosing a top level ontology is that it has been used many many times in real world application. BFO is now in many domains like the QWERTY keyboard. It has established path dependencies and even if it turned out to be a horrible keyboard design it would be impossible to substitute a better keyboard design. So this is the Oboe Foundry ontology suite which is by far the most successful ontology suite thus far which has been expanded since the original which you see here by ontologies like the environment ontology, the ontology for biomedical investigations and the information artifact ontology which in fact motivated the one serious change in BFO in the 12 years since its inception. These are some of the public domain ontologies reusing BFO. You can find a list at the BFO website. Uh, there are also now a number of very large and quite significant non-public domain ontologies using BFO. Uh, the, the user group is very uh, large and the decision making is very uh, consensus based and as I say 
we, we move very slowly. We try to avoid having to make revisions by not making mistakes in the first place. Uh, this is the continuing hierarchy. This is the occurrent hierarchy. And that's it now. That's all the, the, the terms in the BFO hierarchy. The basic structure is a threefold structure. There are continuants, some of which are independent, some of which are dependent. And then there are occurrence. They, they are all universals or close to being universals and then uh, there are instances which are illustrated by the small dots at, at the bottom. All the instances are really existing but they don't all exist now. And Nicola Guarino is the second dot from the left. That means he's a thing. And processes depend on their participants. A lot of this will be very familiar from Dolce and you have to remember that BFO grew up originally as part of a, uh, a collaboration between uh, Dolce and myself in 1998 or thereabouts. So the fundamental ideas are very similar. And then we have uh, John, uh, who is an organism, and John's life, which is a process. And we have John's temperature, which is a quality of John, and which, um, next slide, which also undergoes a process in the course of John's life. So John's temperature goes up and down. John's temperature here is at the, the name of a certain quality which endures from the beginning to the end of John's existence but which instantiates different sub-qualities of the temperature quality at different times. And this is of course a matter of continuous change. So this, is, this diagram is simplified but I didn't have the space to put all the um, temperature qualities which would fill the gaps between the ones which are visible here. So this is John's temperature and the course of John's temperature is John's temperature history and a medical chart of John's rising temperature over a certain short interval of time would be a representation of a segment of the course of John's temperature over a certain period within John's life. Uh, then we have, in addition to qualities like temperature, also dispositions and roles. And we know what dispositions and are. Functions are a special type of disposition. So the function of your heart is the disposition of your heart to pump blood. And dispositions are examples of realizable, dependent continuance, which means they have realizations, which are processes. And diseases are, are examples of dispositions which are on the bad side of things, where functions are on the good side of things. Diseases, like temperature, have courses. So if you have heart disease, which is a disposition of your heart to d do certain things, then your heart disease has a heart disease course, which is a process and which depends on your heart disease in the same way that the course of your temperature depends upon your temperature. And now, finally, just some words about formalization. So the, the BFO be, began uh, as an owl ontology, um, and it, it's been maintained as an owl ontology. It also exists as an oboe ontology and as an Isabel ontology. But we are working currently on uh, refining the first order axiomatization of BFO, which I sent round. And uh, the, the, you can view the current state of the first order logic formalization at the Onto Hub. We're using Cliff, and we have a modular approach, which um, it involves the use of Prover 9 to prove that modules are consistent and then attempt to prove that the different modules are consistent with each other. And all of this work is being done by John Beverly. And John will in the future be using Doll to merge the modules together and allow them to be navigated in various interesting ways. Uh, this is a picture of the modules. And uh, Fabian can tell you all about this aspect of BFO formalization. Uh, but